In this video I'm going to tell you which in my opinions are the best kingdoms in Calradia. I had the pleasure to play at least one full conquest by role playing as any of them, so I'm going to evaluate how they behave at all stages of the game, how useful the culture bonus really is, how good their troops are, how valuable their towns can get, and some more. Starting from the first one, we have the Azrai. The Azrai are one, if not my favorite faction to use when playing this game. They have a lot of great towns that make for a wealthy kingdom. At the end, what do you expect from a kingdom blessed with oil? The towns are also very easy to defend. At the same time, getting over the two choke points near Ortizia and Anustica can be a real pain, especially for the AI. So, despite the Azrai being probably the most wealthy faction in Caradia, they will have an insanely hard time conquering anything due to the geography being their greatest enemy. And in any of my campaigns, that seemed to be the case. The troops can be great when used by the player, but the AI and their lower tier spam often doesn't quite provide a strong enough opponent to be of any real threat. Their lower tiers lack any real humph, and are infantry heavy. The Noble Cavalry line is very squishy at lower tiers, but can get devastating in an open enough map when getting to tier 4 or more. Their top tier infantry is my favorite in the game, as the Palascar plus Azerai veteran combo is among the best the game has to offer, with one being a massive tank that can soak low tier arrows and swings with ease, while the other brings a mean to end axe that rips souls for fun. Their archers are ok, and get the job done, nothing more, and their horse archers need to be used carefully since they have a relatively low amount of arrows. The Azerai culture bonus is quite a good starter. You will not lose speed when traveling through the desert, and you can create caravans per 30% less. All of these while also having a reduced trade penalty of 10%. So early on you definitely want to trade and invest in caravans when playing as an Azerai. And keep in mind that all of these bonuses do apply to your companions as well, regardless of their culture. But since that is the case, the malus also do apply. So your caravan wages, your companion parties and your party as well will demand a 5% increased pay. Honestly speaking, 5% is not a deal breaker, and can very easily be mitigated through perks, policies, or smithing slavery. But later in the game, their culture bonuses become much more of a true malus than anything positive. You will almost never return to the desert, so the speed bonuses loses a lot of its value, and let's not even talk about caravans. By the time you start conquering, they will disappear faster than a young dad going grocery shopping. As for their towns and castles, they are quite hard to attack, especially the castles. Of all settlements in the game, I think the Azerai have some of the best defensive layouts. The Azerai are an A-tier faction in my opinion, very solid all around, but not an easy one to play for an inexperienced player. They lack a real doomstack worthy troop, and their lower tiers can get you into troubles early on. But Tenia goes straight into the S tier. Possibly the best faction for a new player to play as, you get an extremely powerful troop in the Fian Champion, and despite Otson and Wildlings not being all that great, all they really need to do is protect the Fians and let them fire. If you, like me, love some sane masochistic pleasure, you can build an army full of Wildlings and invest into throwing Captain Packs. Be sure to turn on Ragdolls and see horses getting launched into space and soldiers seated to new dimensions. For sure it's one of the most fun ways to play the game, especially if you use the fallback command, but be aware of the fact that your turnover will be quite high. Wildlings tend to get killed quite regularly thanks to their atrocious head armor. As for the culture bonus, Batania has hands down the best in the game, with a bonus of 50% reduction to the speed penalty in forests, and a 15% side bonus it will allow you to run away from early game bandy parties easily, saving you a lot of prison time and money. And if you think about it, Caradia is full of forests, so in any stage of the game you will be affected by this great bonus pretty much anywhere you go. And it's not just that, as a Batanian you also get one extra militia unit each day for your settlements. Militia is great since it doesn't consume food nor gold. It's quite literally a free extra defender each day, and who am I to say not to a volunteer? So where is the trick you may ask? Well, there really isn't one. The cultural malus is a 10% reduction in construction speed for settlements, which is honestly not that impactful and will eventually not matter anymore. As for towns, Batania has some of the best in the game. Quite literally any of their towns can get over 5000 prosperity, and if you don't know what that means, it means money. And money is good. The downside of Batania is in their numbers, and their combat AI. They have the least number of thieves at just 13, and the least amount of clans at 8. Their combat AI doesn't make of the fiance a focal point, and their armies end up being pretty easy to defeat as a result since the rest of the roster is possibly the weakest in the game. 
As long as you can hire a few new clans and defend your borders, Batenia can easily turn into a fierce starting faction to take over the region. And last but not least, they have the best recruit in the game, since it's one of the only one that brings a massive to ended mallet. Hell yeah! The Kuzai for me are a B tier. I think anyone that played with their troops at least one should know how good and cheesy their armies can be. Kansgard and Heavy Horse Archers can win any fight by themselves without pretty much any casualty, but that's a bit boring. Their Foot Archers are also very solid, the most well-rounded in my opinion with a good balance between firepower and protection. The Ravi Cav is fine, but why use it when you can get an almost immortal Kansgard for a little extra cost? Their infantry is not the greatest, but it gets the job done. Their shield might be very small and not great for tanking incoming fire, but their armor and blade will make them great for aggressive tactics. The Kuzites, even in the hands of the AI, when fought on an open map can send a shield down the spine of even an experienced player. They are no ones to be taken lightly. If you do, you might still win, but you will lose a few more troops than you should have. The reason why I place them only in the B tier is their cultural bonus. It's basically the worst there is. Recruiting and upgrading mounted troops being cheaper doesn't really make the horses any more cheap to buy. And honestly, money for upgrading troops is almost never an issue. The 25% production to horses and grazing animals is not that valuable in my opinion. And the massive 20% tax reduction on any settlement is a huge blow, especially when you consider that not many Kuzet towns have a low prosperity to begin with. This faction is all about war, not much more. In order to have success you need to keep winning battles, six towns and sell loot. You get possibly the best troop roster in the game to do so, so good luck with it. The Empire is the jack of all trades, master of none faction. They are good at everything they do military wise. They have a strong infantry troop in the legionary that specializes in taking down heavily armored enemies, but can deal with lower tiers well enough. And the Menableton is a very well balanced shock troop that can deal with both cavalry and infantry. Their foot range options are a dynamic duo with the Palatines being the damage dealers and the crossbowmen the protectors. The Buccellari are a decent flanking option but be aware of their squishy nature. And last but surely not least, the Cataphracts are the jewel of the Empire. The tankiest unit in the game, both mounted and not, and for many, the best melee cavalry option. Their only downside is having a two-handed lance, but remember that by telling them to shield wall, they will only use their sword and it works very well. The mid and lower tiers of the Empire are by far the best out of any faction. They get an archer and a great infantry unit at tier 2. A major upside to the Empire is their vast lands. When combined, they make up for 27 fifths. So there are plenty of towns to take over and control if you choose this culture. As for culture bonuses, the Empire brings a great 20% reduction to garrison wages, 25% more influence from being in an army, at the cost of 20% less village arts growth. The garrison reduction is great, especially in the early stages of your kingdom when money is tight and later on it will still provide value by making you save money. As for why I will place all of the empires in the E tier is because of their locations. War on multiple fronts is inevitable if you happen to join them or start your kingdom with one of their settlements. So it's one of the hardest factions to make work from scratch and their troops are great but not the best. Sturgia for me is an A tier. One of the greatest strengths of Sturgia lies in their great infantry and how cheap it is to amass. Either you prefer Axemen or Spearmen, it doesn't really matter. When paired with line breakers, they will wreak havoc against pretty much any enemy line and melt them away. The Druzinics are also a great option that can fill both heavy cav duties and infantry. And when dismounted, they are a bit better than Axemen or Spearmen in dealing with other troops. Not all of their troops are great though. Their archer is likely the worst tier 5 and needs a very strong archer captain just to work properly. The horse raider is a squishy but versatile unit, quite hard to use, especially when controlled by the AI. Their lower tiers could be far, far better and they lack any true range damage up until tier 3, making their lower rank armies very easy to beat. As for Phibs, Sturgia sits at 15, quite low for a start and not many of their towns are worth owning. Revilomor and Balgard might be the only ones that are quite good. The cultural bonus is tied to their infantry playstyle by reducing the cost of recruiting and upgrading infantry by 25%, which is very useful since infantry is pretty much everywhere. The second bonus is another great one, especially for the AI and it will reduce the army cohesion loss by 20% making any army run longer and save influence. The Malus for Sturgia is a 20% relation penalty for kingdom decisions, but this is very easy to mitigate by doing the old let me throw you at the enemy and save your ass strat, or simply by, well, 
getting a parking charm. Overall, Sturgia makes for a reliable and honestly easy time when taking over the region. Just be very much aware of fighting the Kuzets early on. Your archers and troops will have an hard time keeping up even with a standard army. I suggest waiting for them to siege and defend from the walls, the only Kuzet weakness. Last is Vlandia that I will place in the C tier. From the glory days of sharpshooter spam to today, the Vlandians have, like their Lord Erthert, fallen hard into mediocrity. Let that be Derter preferring to invest into oil presses rather than giving scalps to his sergeants, I can say for sure. But one thing is certain, Vlandia is only good if you plan to start a kingdom by attacking them. They have one of the best starting locations in the entire map, completely surrounded by a sea in the west and south, that makes sure that towns like Praven, Roval, Tostic and Galland and Jaculan might never be touched by your enemies. Vlandia, generally speaking, gets a very huge lead thanks to having 11 starting clans and the most towns out of any kingdoms with A. This makes sure they can put pressure on their enemies early on, and oftentimes they can conquer Batania and a good chunk of the Western Empire if they get lucky. Their downside is that although they have a lot of clans and starting towns, Vlandia has no future, in the sense that they don't have many young lords replacing the older ones, or the dead in case we play with death enabled. When it comes to their armies, Vlandia is quite standard, heavily reliant on cavalry with a bulk of sharpshooters and a few infantry units. Their best unit by far is the Banner Knight, far better than the Vanguard and way more useful than a sergeant when dismounted. The rest of the Vlandian roster is mediocre at best, and yes, that includes the sharpshooters too. After Pack 1.8, they no longer have bullseye accuracy, they now tend to miss a bit too often, and don't have the same impact as before. As for cultural bonus, Vlandia doesn't have a great one, 5% more renown from battles is fine, but nothing drastic. 15% more income while serving as a mercenary is once again fine, but first, we must be a mercenary in order to benefit from it, that means running caravans gets very risky, if we also want to benefit from the bonus. And honestly, 15% of a 200 gold contract is just 30 denaries. Yes, it's 30 for every influence you turn in, but a caravan will make much more each day. The 10% production increase for castles I think speaks for itself. It's just not really beneficial since towns are much better to own over castles. And on top of that, the Malus is an influence drain that will increase the cost of calling lords of our parties by 20%. So there you have it people. My opinion about what factions are the best in Calradia when it comes to kingdoms and how they fare in taking over the entire region.